I'm Joanne Kalein and I'm the coordinator at the Adult Cystic Fibrosis Clinic at Northwestern and my co-moderator. I'm uh, Jen Kim's father. I'm the one of the adult clinic coordinators at the University of Utah Cystic Fibrosis Center. And we'd like to welcome you today to Hot Topics in Nursing. We chose three topics that lately on the listserv seem to have been bringing up a lot of questions and people looking for for answers. I don't know that we necessarily have the answers, but we have some folks who are willing to share what they have done to try and get to a better place. So our objectives today are to assemble a collection of best practices for maintenance ther therapy, including the high, highly effective modulator therapy. So those folks that you haven't seen in a year, we wanna figure out how to get them back in clinic. Then we want to identify current trends in pregnancy while a modulator therapy. And then we want to identify and develop a working relationship between the pediatric and adult transition programs for patients to try and ease that, especially um, in this day of things changing with the, the modulator therapy. So we have a number of very, very wonderful top speakers today for you. And we would like to begin. So we're going to start with the topic of transition this morning. And I would like to welcome our first speaker, Catherine Enox. Um, Catherine is the pediatric CF coordinator at Mott Children's Hospital at the University of Michigan. She has 12 years of dedicated CF experience and eight years as a program coordinator. And today she is presenting on her project, um, and I am already forgetting what the title was. I'm opening it up as we speak. She's uh, presenting her um, topic of multi-center quality improvement of transition readiness using CF Rise. And here is Catherine. Good morning. So, um, as she said, my name is Katherine Enox, and I am the nurse at the University of Michigan. So, my disclosures are just related to portions of my effort that are supported through the CF Foundation and the CF Learning Network Center grants. We're going to go through what transition readiness program we used, how we developed QI around our team's needs, our project design, our drivers, and our results. So CF Rise is a transition readiness education tool that is a product of the CF Foundation. So it was created so that people living with CF can use this transition tool set to work with their caregivers and their care teams to become more independent. With support from the CF Foundation, a panel of CF experts convened um, and created the program, which was funded by Gilead Sciences, but not branded. Then in um, 2015, the pilot took place and centers began implementing it into their clinics, including the University of Michigan. In 2022, the CF Foundation took over ownership of CF Rise and updated portions, including adding new uh, modules for modulators and emotional health. And then in addition to the paper format that you can utilize, there's an online portal with individual login for easy access by clinicians for monitoring and coordination across their center, and also by people with CF for module completion, personal tracking, and access to education resources based on their needs. So responsibility checklists are used to compare perceptions of responsibility ownership between the person with CF and their caregiver. This sparks conversations to aid in slow, developmentally appropriate transfer of responsibility over time. Modules are used to assess for any gaps in knowledge around a variety of topics from lifestyle or insurance to CF-related diabetes and modulators. At the University of Michigan CF program, we've been engaged with CF Rise since the pilot was done nearly a decade ago. And over the years, we've implemented a variety of um, QI projects looking at different ways to engage with patients and spread confidence and knowledge throughout our team. Then we had kind of a bit of a pause in early mid 2020, as you all experienced. And in late 2021, we decided to kind of look more closely at CF Rise again. 
We had one main CFRI's champion, Julie, our social worker, and uh, she initiated the, uh, she initially introduced CFRI's to people with CF and their families. She helped them gain access to the portal and began kind of managing the module completions and planning with the team as individuals move through the program. Over the years, though, we had a varied clinician involvement across the disciplines. And so after Julie initiated the program, she would utilize those people to then help get through the modules. But with the inevitable pause in use, retraining was kind of seen as our first need for our team. And so we began with our main CF nurse, Jordan. Now, due to the open communication in our team, some essential feedback about CFRI's use for the team was provided. So while the CFRI's portal is amazing for tracking and use by people with CF, clinicians, especially when the team is large, had a really hard time navigating any system outside of the hospital's electronic health record or EHR, which for us was epic. So, or is epic, I should say. <laughs> we essentially were kind of stuck in a model like this picture. So our biggest barrier was not the training, but was finding a way to move from this model to this model, where all parties have easy access to the same tools and people, and this would also provide integration of CFRI's processes into the already established, established preclinic and clinic processes for the care team. So basically, the lift isn't as heavy for our team if we can find a way to integrate CFRI's into our EHR. You know the saying, if you build it, will they come and actually use it? <laughs> So we are gonna find out. In late 2021, we started the process of creating a custom CFRI's documentation function in the EHR. Interestingly enough, other centers were reevaluating their CFRI's utilization as the topic came up on the program coordinator's listserv email. So responding with hopeful build information that I could share, then a bunch of other centers expressed interest in seeing what we had made. The following month, we actually gained access to our new documentation section, but before we spread it everywhere, we thought about how the use of the tool might be tested so that it could be adjusted and optimized for best use before that spread. So in talking with my CF Center Director, Dr. Sammy Nasser, we ended up reaching out to the CF Learning Network to see if we could connect with other CFLN centers to test our tool. The CF Learning Network is currently 36 CF programs, although it is growing, and U of M is included. And they perform network-wide quality improvement and engagement, and so we have access to the same QI tools and have received the same sort of QI trainings and application practices through CFLN coordinated and led projects. So we received some kind of ad hoc support from CFLN, and then we reached out to centers who had spread expressed interest on the listserv, but were who also, excuse me, who were also members of CFLN. By May of 2022, we had held an information session at U of M to explain the tool and our idea for shared QI practice to a few centers. And then by June, we had ourselves and Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center pediatric program on board. So we held a few meetings from July to December of 2022 in preparation for the start of the project. Cincinnati had to build the tool using U of M's resources so that we had similar experiences within the EPIC platform. We had to fully analyze all of the barriers to our current process for CFRIs because it's not just about a tool in the EHR, it's about all the other things that go on with utilizing CFRIs. We set our SMART aim, which is specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. And then our teams worked together to find what the key drivers of the project were and what the interventions might need to, we might need to try to reach those drivers. And of course, data collection had to be determined, which was collaboratively designed and then hosted and managed through U of M's REDCap platform. So we came up um, with this global aim of preparing people with CF for transition to the adult clinic using CFRIs. But our specific aim was to implement and document CFRIs module completion by people with CF, increasing from 10.5% to 75% by, um, per month within six months. Our population, we kept to people with CF who were 16 years and older who came to clinic and had, already, and had not already declined the CFRIs program or had completed the program entirely. CFRIs does have 10 to 15 age modules, but we decided to stick with 16 plus until we kind of um, came up with the best process before expanding. Are we ready? 
So here is our fancy tool. It's actually just a customization of an area already used heavily for education documentation in the inpatient units, at least at U of M, um, but in our outpatient ambulatory care, it wasn't utilized very much. So because it's designed to fit into an already established Epic feature, the build and the sharing of the build was much easier and likely less costly than trying to fully customize or purchase a new Epic feature. So I want to quickly show you and navigate you, especially for those not familiar with Epic. We have an education tab where education activities live. You can search for an activity by activity name, and then you can select specific sections of that activity. And in this case, that's the pancreatic insufficiency and nutrition CFRISE module. We indicated the likely educator for the module, and although we know that there are disciplines, including nursing, physicians, among others, that can cover the entire program with their knowledge, we wanted to help guide our entire CF care team to split up the modules and share workload according to their areas of expertise. And lastly, there's a handout section that links directly to the blank CFRISE modules and answer guides. This is particularly helpful if you have technical difficulties with the patient using their own device um, signing into the portal when you're in clinic, or if your care team decides to implement the paper method only. Of note, we did not build all the module questions into EPIC. This documentation is to convey what modules or checklists were completed and how they were received by the person with CF, as well as any knowledge remediation that may have been done or resources provided. But we don't really care to have the score in EPIC. Since the conversation and the education is the most important piece, it also means that if modules are updated with new questions and things like that, I don't have to go to my IT team and change everything. We can still utilize this for communication with, and, and then utilize the CFRISE platform for if we're looking at specific questions. Now, if you click on that link, you actually see this module. So this is an example of one of the modules and it shows up on your computer screen. And so in our clinic, we have printers right in our room with the patient. So I could print this if I needed to. If I was on a virtual visit, I could share my screen and we could talk through it instead of having them fill it out. Um, or the patient could be doing it on their device and you're looking here on your computer to know what we're talking about without having to be right over their shoulder. Additionally, Epic has a dot phrase feature, which means you literally type in your note a period and a phrase, and then you click enter. And this will populate some documentation from within the patient's chart. So for this, we use dot education enter, and you get a list of all the modules completed that day, who did them, and what the outcome was. And this feature is also collapsible when you're in the chart review, and so it doesn't take up much room in your note because it just collapses until somebody wants to expand and look further. It also standardizes the documentation and reduces double documentation or transcription errors because it's actually linked to the original source. So one of the main goals of this project was to ensure that we had a key driver diagram that could be used um, by others who want to implement the same tool into EPIC, but that would also be high level enough that other centers could consider its use when implementing CFRISE improvements at all, regardless of the EHR platform. If you've never seen a key driver diagram before, that's okay. They can be a bit overwhelming, but in the end, they're actually pretty simple. Project planning is on the left with your global aim, your project smart aim, and then the population, as you see here. Then the key areas that are driving the interventions are listed in the middle. Ours were transparency in patient needs prior to clinic, an active team, dedicated time for that multidisciplinary team to implement CFRIs in virtual and in-person clinics, which actually only takes about five to 10 minutes, depending on the module and the patient. And then it's the, um, another driver was the easy access to CFRIs materials and engaged patients and families. And then all the interventions that we tested are shown on the right and connected to their appropriate driver. So our interventions are to help us reach those drivers. We worked on preclinic communication, our tracking systems, the EHR tool itself, assigning modules to each team member or discipline, putting materials in accessible locations, including the EHR, increasing training and access to training materials, 
and then co-produce the CF rise plan with the patient. We know that some days just aren't the right day, or a person with CF brought along a, a friend or a, a family member where the topic just isn't the best one to do in company. And so we wanted to ensure that our internal processes still prioritize the needs and desires of the person with CF. So it's finally project time. The project ran January through June of 2023, and we held regular Zoom meetings every other week for the first four months and then shifted to monthly after that. We tracked and shared PDSAs, troubleshooted our interventions and challenges, shared ideas. We had different PDSAs applied at different times, which fit our individual clinics best, but the themes were similar given the drivers. So U of M had already been involved in CFRIs in the past, and so we implemented immediately across all of our clinics, where Cincinnati had a robust transition program that hadn't included CFRIs yet. And so they did smaller tests of change, where they did one physician in one clinic with one patient on one day, <laughs> and then Expanded out from there. So we're trouble. Uh, we also troubleshooted our tracking and report building, shared what worked and what didn't, and of course we went back and adjusted our key driver diagram, our barriers assessment, and our EHR tool itself on our uh, based on our mutual experience. So here are the results. Our first two months on the slide represent the baseline CFRISE module completion and documentation using the EHR tool and our previous practices of just one discipline doing most of the work. As we jump to that, oh, apologies, there it is. As we jump to that third point, um, in the first month of that project, you can see immediate impact with increase of module completions. And while there are some monthly fluctuations as we work through our PDSAs, you can see the trend is steadily climbing, leaning more towards reaching sustainability, although time will tell for that. We plan to continue to, to collect data through the end of the year and assess that sustainability after our meetings and projects officially completed in June of 2023. While we didn't reach our goal of 75% completion rate, the more important Im impact is consistent utilization through the entire program. So poster 674 reviews the project, but the abstract only includes the three-month data, although it does include the KDD. In addition to just gathering whether an eligible patient had one or more modules done and documented, we also wanted to examine the impact of expansion across multiple team members and multiple disciplines. And while we've heard that including more disciplines is the best method, we were excited to see these results that really support that modules that more modules are completed when more disciplines are involved. Those first two months are the baseline again. Um, and then as we shift, you can see those with um, 10 and 11 individuals involved. Um, representing 75% or three-fourths of the um, four disciplines of the months where four disciplines were engaged, you actually have 27 to 25 modules completed across those disciplines compared to the months with nine or fewer team members that showed 10 to 19 modules completed. So where do we go from here? We've begun expansion to another CF center, Cook Children's Hospital in Texas, and plan uh, to collect data on their implementation. We've upgraded the Epic Turbocharger package, which is a turnkey file for uploading the tool from one Epic site to another Epic site. Um, and we've also um, are updating the self-build tools. We are completing our multi-center manuscript, and we hope to um, send that out at the end of this year or um, early next year once we get it published for people to be able to utilize these tools. And then we're continuing our PDSAs, um, expanding down to the 10 to 15 group, and then expanding out to our adult programs um, since CFRI is, is intended um, to go even up to age 25 and that we can continue the program as they transition into adult. Adulthood. And then lastly, we need to assess the equity of this implementation. So our goal with this was to reach people in clinic, but sometimes the people who don't come to clinic are the ones who actually really need CFRIs and, and that transition. And so we are aware of that, wanted to hone in on the, the way to use this program, the best for our clinic processes, but definitely that's an, an, a, the next step for us. And lastly. I want to say thanks to our teams who helped um, helped us get through this. Thanks to Cincinnati Children's Hospital for joining us in this endeavor and the CF Learning Network for supporting us throughout. With that, I'll take any questions. Thanks, Kathy. That was a great talk. I have a question. So I see that you, if you go back to the slide where you actually demonstrated by month the number of modules completed, I'm just curious. I, you said five minutes, but I've not been to a CF clinic where only one person's in there for five minutes. So I'm just curious, like, how is that working? 
are those unique numbers like in that month? So for example, 29? Yes. Of, okay. So are you targeting at preclinic? Okay, this person needs pharmacy, you're going to do this module. Like how is that working out? And is it adding additional time? Yeah, our goal is to not overwhelm the patients and not overwhelm the clinic. Um, and so the CFRI's champion actually still uh, plans out, checks the CFRI's portal since we use it. Cincinnati was using paper, so didn't need to, but we still check the portal just in case we have a type A student who goes in and completes anything. It's pretty rare, but it happens on occasion. And so then at, at our preclinic huddle, she actually says, okay, they need to do some CFRI's. Who has the time looking at your schedule? Who thinks, who wants to cover? Here's some of the topics that need to be done. You know, RN or RD, can one of you do it? And so what we're trying to do is expand kind of one person sees each patient versus having four people see one patient and then nobody see the next patient. So we're spreading the disciplines out throughout the clinic day and the week. So it takes five to 10 minutes for CFRIs for one person. And so then that maybe only adds a little bit of time to clinic, but sometimes that was time that they would have been waiting. Sometimes that's time that they're waiting uh, in between spirometry. Maybe they're having a post bronchodilator. And so then the you know, the RT is like, oh, well, this is a great time for me to do CFRIs then while we're waiting during that time. So we really try to spread it across. And that's these are um, total numbers across both centers. And so we definitely don't have 11 people in clinic <laughs> doing CFRIs on one patient. That's just not feasible. So, yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Did you? Oh, did you have a lot of problems with um getting buy-in from IT to work with you and institute putting this into the system? Um, yes and no. So I, you know, I put in a ticket, I wasn't in a rush, and it took probably, I want to say, four months before we got ours built. And then we were like, oh, hey, we should spread this. So then we do all the work to spread it. And then Cincinnati Children's got theirs um, done fairly quickly. I want to say within a couple months. I think we gave it to them in like May and they had it by July. Um, but Cook Children's was actually going to join us at the beginning and they had a year delay with their IT team. Um, and there was like, you know, optimizations or whatever happening at their center. And so they were like, we're not doing anything extra right now. So that's why they're on the second phase is because of IT delays. All right. We had a couple questions come in through the app. Um, from Sue Gray, great work. Was there a specific roadblock to starting this project? A specific roadblock? Um, I think the hardest part about the project is the um, time in clinic and short staffing. I mean, that's just always a problem. Um, so you can see what disciplines here are more involved, and that just happened to be in our clinics, the ones who were able to do that. There are some disciplines that couldn't work it in in the time of the project we've since expanded. Um, and even the nursing engagement um, at our center was like one or two of the nurses would engage in our highly CF populated clinics, but that we didn't, by the end of the project, we hadn't expanded to every single nurse in our center yet at U of M. Great. Also, um, we're we're running the pilot of CFRIs in Australia now. Do you have any insights or key learnings into how we roll this out and engage new clinics and coordinators? I think the key is all disciplines. Even in the pilot study that's published for CFRIs, everybody's like, we love it, it's great, the patients love it, the clinicians love it, this is awesome. And then they're like, but one of the limitations is coordination with the care team. And so that's where I felt like this program was really helpful for us, is what our team needs is a way to integrate it into their uh, practices already. So whatever your clinic is doing, it's not, hey, let's take our clinic and move them over here to do CFRIs. It's how do you take CFRIs and maybe alter it or figure out how the process works for you. Um, so you're obviously not altering the content per se, but you're, you can alter the way that you utilize the tool. And once you do that, it's, it's much easier to integrate into your team. Great. Um Two other questions just came in. You said the patient can get it on the portal. How does that work? Do you have to send them a questionnaire? Yeah, so on the CF Rise portal, I, I 
dislike the word portal because everybody has a portal, right? We have our own U of M health portal and all of this. So um, on, the U, on the CFRI's website, um, the clinicians log in and then they can invite a patient. The patient then logs in and then they have access to these modules and can actually pick which one that they want. They could do four in a day, they could do one. Um, and so they pick it and it literally comes up on their phone or their device and they can go through the questionnaire. So that, um, that slide that I had of, uh, where is it? The actual questionnaire. Oh, there it is. So they would have this where they can literally click A, B, C, or D of the questionnaire. And then um, that once they hit submit, that goes to the center and the center can see the results. Um, and it also provides um, resources based on the questions that they got wrong. Um, so. Great. And one last question. Will there be a time when you can share the EPIC build for others to share it with their IT departments? Yes, so uh, our manuscript is being written right now. We're updating the turbocharger package as well as the individual tools. And then we're trying to find a way to put that communication within the manuscript um, so that that can be shared more easily. Um, I have all these big goals of putting it somewhere in EPIC itself so people can who have EPIC can download it. Um, but I think the, the cool thing about our key driver is that it's really just about the communication and integrating it into your clinic. And so whether or not you have EPIC, however you decide to document it, whether that's in your EHR or an Excel tracking sheet, if that works for your clinic, um, I'm excited for the, the ability to share the tool with you so that you all can kind of implement those different things into your clinics. So I'll, I'll put it out on the listserv as soon as we get it published. And to be honest, I'm really hoping for early 2024, but that's going to be up to the journal that we submitted to. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up I'd like to welcome Katie Clemens to the stand. Um, she is also presenting on transition. She's a pulmonary nurse clinician and clinic coordinator for the adult cystic fibrosis program at Northwestern Medicine, where she's been at for the last four and a half years. Um, she's going to present on a joint effort in transition with pediatric and adult programs. And the title of her talk is, It's Time for Mom to Leave the Room. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I have no disclosures to disclose. Um, by the end of this talk, you'll be able to collaborate with pediatric and adult CF programs for the transition patient, enhance communication skills during transitions, secure seamless patient information transfer from pediatric to adult care, and address anxiety from the transitioning patient and family. As many of you are likely aware, patient transitions can occasionally become a nightmare. These difficulties may stem from a series of unfortunate events, including miscommunications, missing documents, or the classic telephone game. Such issues can result in frustrations for both healthcare teams and immediately erode the trust of the transitioning patient and family. There have been several abstracts and papers written on this topic to provide guidance to CF centers related to the pediatric transition to the adult cystic fibrosis clinic. This slide summarizes what these authors recommend. Office and Harris suggest having a shared transition protocol with a standardized tools, meeting the adult team prior to transition to help ease anxiety, start early, um, starting early discussions and promote independence to, to young adults and maintaining ongoing interactions um, and reconnect if engaging wanes. Seeing it all suggests having structured and organized processes and having a closed working relationships between the pediatric and adult CF teams. We see a theme keeping transition standardized, structured, and organized, which they find in the solution to efficient and effective communications in the transition process. 
How does our pediatric team help facilitate transitions before the actual transition? The Lurie Children's Pediatric CF team, which is our sister peds team, does an extraordinary job in preparing their, their patients for the transition to adulting by starting education early and often. They prepare the patient by initiating the idea of leaving the pediatric clinic and transitioning as a concept very early in the diagnosis. But education begins during middle school and high school with a timeline initiated no later than high school with a varying range of topics such, of, such as encouraging self-care and disease knowledge. Other discussion points include asking the patient what medications do you take? When do you do your treatments and who sets up your treatments? These questions focus on encouraging future adult patients to take responsibility of their care as they get older. Documentation is key. All providers document the transfer of care plan for all patients who are 18 years of age or older. A smart phrase in EPIC, which is our EMR, is used to ease the workload. This note also documents when and where they plan to transition. Transition education is recorded in the EMR on a flow sheet during the clinic visit. Healthcare providers can choose relevant transition related topics for discussion. The PEDS team also provides the option for the patient to meet our adult team members ahead of transition if they feel that would help ease any fears or anxiety. How do we help transition our patients together? Communication is key. Just like the authors recommend, we also believe that communication is key, and this is how we communicate the needs of transition patients. We hold a joint team meeting every other month with both the peds and adult teams to discuss upcoming transition patients and complete the handoff of the patient from the peds and the adult team. Meetings are conducted in a hybrid format, combining in-person and virtual elements to maximize engagement and participant at each session. Topics are also meaningful and to the point for time efficiency. Along with the upcoming transition patients, we also provide brief updates and each team's QI projects, research studies, and other pertinent team updates such as staffing changes and introducing new team members. We have identified three essential elements that our adult C CF team needs for a more seamless transition. These elements are a standardized transition letter, a copy of original genetic mutations, and a copy of a, the long summary of the SMART report collated by the CFF. The transition letter is, written, a, is the written patient handoff of the patient report tool to provide the pertinent and essential information about the patient. The adult and pediatric teams have collectively decided uh, what topics to include in the letter and how to format it that works best for, for our team. The original CF genetic mutation reports are important for modulator approvals, as well as ensuring appropriate decision-making for repeating genetic testing in the future. The SMART report summaries is a snapshot of the data that is collected and entered into the CF Foundation patient re registry. In order to do this, they must consent to part participate. How is the trans transition letter created? The transition letter can be efficiently formatted by utilizing templates and SMART phrases to extract a majority of patient information directly from the chart. This approach minimizes the effort and requires required to, to create the letter for the PEDS team, as elements like PFTs, medical history, medications, and allergies are automatically sourced from the patient's chart using SMART phrases. The pediatric team also provides this document to all transferring patients, not only those transferring to NM. So this document can be used as a universal letter for all patients transferring out of the PEDS clinic. This letter is sent directly to the CF clinic or provider from the PEDS team. These letters are 
important as conveniences like Care Everywhere are not easily searchable for items like genetics, microorganism, and sweat testing, causing time-consuming searching in multiple places. These letters were crafted by combining elements from various templates used by CF centers of a similar scale to ours. We then tailored the document to precisely address the unique requirements of our teams while striving to ensure its eff efficiency and readability are maximized. I've come to realize the significance of verifying the patient's original genetics and ensuring they match the information in the CFF registry and past clinic notes. Human error over the years can lead to misidentified genetics. These discrepancies can potentially hinder patients from receiving further genetic testing or even essential mod modulator therapy. Such oversights can and do occur. It is crucial to thoroughly investigate whether the patient's genetic genetics qualify for MAP retesting or deletion duplication testing through, extent, through exter, external genetic testing providers like in Vitae. Some patients may have slipped through the cracks due to limited resources at their previous centers or perhaps were just lost to follow up. The image shown represents the first page of the CF Smart Report, which may appear blurry in this photo due to the small print resulting from extensive data points in the information it contains. However, it also offers a wealth of valuable data all in one central location. The two graphs on the right display trends in lung function and weight and solid lines for hospitalization and IV antibiotics. The entire SMART report long summary is approximately five to six pages total. Data included in the SMART report are genetic mutation and sweat values, clinic hospitalizations and IV dates, lung functions, weight and BMI, imaging, labs and micro results, medication and allergies, and research studies and what research study the patients can qualify for. Just to list a few. These are helpful for the provider, but also to the patient as well. So we like to hand these out and give them to them. When we receive these three documents for transition, patient, um, for the transition patient, we load them into the patient's chart before their first adult CF clinic visit. This way, the entire team can review them at their leisure wherever they are. Life hack. Do it as soon as you receive them, so you don't lose the document and have to request them from the center again, because that's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> Scheduling a patient who has been transitioned is easy, but what do we do if we get a call out of the blue about a patient who is not discussed in our joint team meetings? We reach out to the pediatric team and ask if this patient is appropriate for transition and request approval to schedule with our adult team. If it is not okay, the peds team will reach out to the patient or family to discuss the next steps for their clinic and plan of care, for the next steps in their clinic and plan of care. If scheduling is approved, we will schedule the patient and request the patient to be added to the agenda at the next joint team meeting. If the patient schedules their appointment before the next joint team meeting, we ask for the three important documents we have just discussed prior. That's the transition letter, original genetics, and the SMART report. We then load them into the patient's chart for the adult C CF team members to all review. Premature appointments could also occur in my experience because the young adult wants greater ownership of their care with a fresh start and this is a very good sign and should be encouraged. As you may know, you, it can be scary to leave a team that the CF patient has been, been with throughout their entire lives. So we offer ways to ease the anxiety by offering tours and adult CF uh, of the adult CF clinic space and inpatient units if they were to be admitted for tune-ups and offering introductions of the adult CF providers and other team members at the transitioning patient's pe pediatric CF clinic visit or inpatient stay before their transition. Immediately after the transition, 
We as the adult team only offer in-person visits for the first two to three visits before starting a telehealth rotation to enhance trust, ease anxiety, and continue to build relationships between the new patient and team members. So the new transition patient builds a relationship with the adult CF team and will be agreeable at some point soon to let mom leave the room during their CF visits if they haven't already. In conclusion, there are several steps to smoothly, smoothly transition um, pediatric CF patients to an adult CF clinic. You can now apply these tactics to your own clinic transitions, which include collaborate with the pediatric and adult CF programs for the transition patient, enhance communication skills during transitions, secure seamless seamless patient information transfer from pediatric to adult care, and address the anxiety of the transitioning patient and family. With that, here are some photos of the Northwestern Medicine Adult CF team and the Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital pediatric team. I want to especially thank them for the ongoing collaboration and transitioning patients and so much more that we do together. Samples of the discussed documents are available upon request at my email provided on the slide. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'd like to open it up for questions. See, he's got a question. Great presentation. Can oh. you tell me a little bit about that? combined meeting that you have every other how do you prepare for to which patients i know they all have a transition plan which is great but we know those plans always change and in my experience we've sometimes talked about patients and then they for whatever reason don't make that transition visit for another six months so what does your process kind of look like um so we usually, I mean, it kind of depends. So if things change drastically from the, like, obviously the PEDS team would update us. Or what we usually do is we put them back on the agenda and we re-discuss them in a future joint team meeting if that needs to happen. Um, sometimes, um, usually if they don't, call us and the patient hasn't been transitioned, they most often haven't seen the pediatric team either. So nobody knows what's going on is generally what happens. And they transition from, from what we know from the meeting from before. Thank you. Yes. Hi there. Thanks for your presentation. Oh, yeah. Um, we've often seen um, New patients struggle um, when they maybe aren't developmentally uh, mature enough to handle the, the load of um, and, and treatment burden on, on their own. And uh, oftentimes they just don't engage. Uh, voicemail box is full, my chart message is not read. Oh, you're in the emergency room. And <laughs> any thoughts about how to um, increase engagement by those? Um, young folks that are uh, really struggling with um, the, the mental load of um, transition? Um, yeah, so we, like I mentioned, we do have a telehealth rotation that we like to put, or well, the patients like to, to be put on. Um, so it, we generally do the three month follow ups and then rotate in person, telehealth in person um, with those patients that lack engagement. They generally, we prefer them to come in in person so we have eyes on them with the education and follow ups and make sure they're compliant. And we, you know, do the, the formal spiros every three months. And we also have um, somebody, usually our social worker, check up on them in between. And we make sure that happens um, in our uh, multidisciplinary meetings that we have weekly. So um, we we all collectively kind of keep up with them and, and see how we're doing. Um, and generally, with, with the transition, if they've recently transitioned with pediatrics and they're more immature sound, sounding or feeling, um, usually mom or dad's stays with that patient um, until they're mature enough to, to be able to handle themselves in their care. Can 
Got a couple of questions here on the Q&A um, mm -hmm. from Sue Gray. Not a question, but suggestion to remind everyone to upload a copy of mutation analysis and sweat tests into the registry. This is so helpful. Yes, yes. So easy <laughs> instead of searching forever. Hey. Good morning. Hello, everyone. Hello, um, I'm Nicole from uh, University of North Carolina Adult Program. And I am curious to meet some of the people in my region, so please come say hello afterwards, because I feel like I send a lot of people um, as they're transitioning to other centers in our area. Um, it's more of like a comment. Uh, we are very fortunate at UNC to have a same EPIC system, so I feel like that transition letter that you created is great, but maybe not so much for patients that are staying in the same electronic record or same center. But I find that our transition meetings are so much more impactful when we're sharing all the off-chart knowledge that providers have gained in 10 years. So it's going to be the things that you have in your sticky notes, the dog's name, the cancer treatments that the mom is going through. So um, I didn't know if that was part of the letter or not. Again, it's kind of like the not charted stuff that a nurse who's taking care of them their whole life can share with me as the nurse taking over their care. So that's not it, whatever. <laughs> um, I, I can't speak for Lurie for um, transitions outside of the center, um, but so we put the letter into our charts and we load it, but that's also why we have the joint team meeting. So we, we kind of get to know the patient personally um, and we, we share those little um, pearls um, during the joint team meeting. So we, we, we get to, to know them. Yeah, thank you. Uh, another question here, um, do records release cover the SMART report being sent to the adult center? Not quite sure, this is from Wendy Tag. Maybe she can clarify. Um, I, I think she means uh, like a release of information yeah. Yeah. for the registry smart report. I, I don't usually use right. those, There's a separate consent for registry as opposed to your records release uh -huh. that you're sending from your EMR. So mm -hmm. until they're consented at the new center, what's the legality of sending over that, that report that long report to you. Oh, that's a good question. That is a good question. I didn't think of that. <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. We'll have to look into that. Thank you. More information to come. Yes. And I have one Thank more you. question, Katie. Yeah. Um, so sorry. Yeah. Um, for adult um, providers, how do you get them to attend those meetings to talk about patients? Um, I mean, we've had them for quite some time. Um, there are, they've been pretty standard. Um, a lot of reminders, a lot of reminding from Joanne. Um, <laughs> Joanne <the> like, <laughs> likes to block um, clinic time for the providers that are consistently tardy. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> Most of our, if not all, of, I would say 99% of our providers en en enjoy the meeting and yeah. So we, we have a pretty good attendance and, and that's why we also offer it virtual um, because we're all over the place. All of, all of our providers wear many hats. So um, that, that has also helped our, our attendance. So that's been helpful. I think that wraps it up. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Next up, we have Christine Decker-Hughes. Um, Christine is one of the nurse coordinators for the Adult Cystic Fibrosis Program at UC San Diego Health and a telephonic resource nurse for Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego. Um, she also has a special interest in lactation and women's health in 
<clears throat> the advent of HEMT therapies. And the title of her presentation is She's Having a Baby. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be presenting here today at my first in-person NACFC. Um, these last few days have been amazing. I've learned so much. I'm very thankful for the opportunity to present on this very important topic. Um, and I am very passionate about pregnancy and lactation in mothers with CF. And I'm hoping that I can share some tools uh, with you today. So our objectives today for this presentation are the following. Uh, we're just gonna do a brief report on current pregnancy trends and cystic fibrosis, review the current clinical considerations, evaluate the use of medications in pregnancy and lactation, and discuss lactation considerations for mothers with CF. And then we're gonna identify support and resources for mothers with CF and professional resources for providers and healthcare staff. So as most of us are surely aware, the pregnancy rate in mothers with cystic fibrosis more than doubled in recent years, really taking off in 2020 in what some term as the trikafta baby boom, where we saw a steep increase in the number of pregnancies from 310 in 2019 to almost double at 619 in 2020. In the years since the introduction of trikafta, we've seen pregnancy rates at 600 plus yearly. This is amazing considering just five to 10 years ago, many women with CF didn't think having a baby would be possible for them. When I entered the CF field about five years ago, um, you know, I've had my lactation consultant license for probably 10 plus years at that time. And I honestly didn't think that I would get the chance to use it, but I've been pleasantly surprised in the past year. So now that more women with CF are deciding to have families of their own, the conversation regarding family planning needs to take place more regularly. This includes having open discussions and clinic visits with women of childbearing age, um, considering pre-pregnancy health, such as um, getting them to optimal nutritional status, good blood sugar control if they have CFRD, and maximizing their lung health. Also considering treating infections that might need medications that are contraindicated during pregnancy or lactation. Um, also discussing birth control and future interest in pregnancy and referring to the appropriate specialist if needed. One of the things that's been brought up in some of the other talks is that you know CF providers are not really comfortable broaching these sexual and reproductive health conversations. So one of the other um, one of the other talks mentioned just using the one key question initiative, which is, do you want to get pregnant in the next year? Or as Dr. Kazmierski said, do you want to be a parent in the next year? I think this really would help to open up the conversation. If they say yes, I feel like that's inviting, um, you know, to discuss what does that mean to you? Do you want to get pregnant? Do you want to explore fertility? Do you want to adopt? So you can kind of see what your patients mean by that statement. And if they say no, then that also opens the door to, okay, you don't want to get pregnant right now or you don't want to be a parent, so what are we going to do to prevent that? Um, and then lastly, but most importantly, I feel like we really need to push and encourage people with CF to have annual health screenings and to do self-screenings as recommended. Um, such as pap smears, breast exams, testicular exams, prostate exams, STI screenings, and HPV vaccination. I, I listened to a talk earlier in the week uh, about some testicular cancer cases and some 17-year-olds, so this is really important. And um, some of the other talks said that, you know, our CF patients typically use us as their primary care providers, so we have a great opportunity to be helpful in this instance to them. So I won't spend too much on this slide, but as healthcare providers, we also need to be prepared to answer questions and refer to family planning specialists as needed, such as OBGYN, fertility specialists, and genetic counselors regarding the risks of having a baby with CF. Um, so that would include testing the partner and referring to a genetic counselor if needed. There are testing that can be done during pregnancy, such as amniocentesis and chorionic villi sampling. And then there's also the routine newborn screening. 
So now we're gonna talk about using modulators during pregnancy and lactation. So there is no consensus guidelines. There's only recommendations. Um, there's a great um, uh, article put out by, or recommendations put out by the sharing group um, for the CFF. And so I'm just gonna kind of summarize some of what they said there. Um, there needs to be a conversation between the provider and family uh, to weigh out the risks and benefits to the mother. Consider again, pre-pregnancy health, such as lung function and nutritional status. At our center, we typically hold during the first trimester or recommend holding during the fir first trimester while things are rapidly forming for the fetus um, and then resuming later on in the second trimester. However, we've had patients that have had to resume Trikafta at an earlier point due to deterioration in their health. And some of our patients have decided to stay on throughout their pregnancy. And we also recommend close follow-up with uh, monthly monitoring at our clinic. So use of modulators during pregnancy, fetal considerations. So we consider the risk to the newborn due to the in, in utero exposure to modulators as this can lead to a false newborn screening. So if the baby has any symptoms of CF, we should consider early genetic screening and sweat testing. Um, in animal studies, and um, as we've heard in some of the other talks, there, ha there is a risk of cataracts with ivacaftor containing products. And there's also a risk of hepatotoxicity due to metabolism of the drug. So we would encourage baseline uh, measurements and further surveillance if abnormal for cataracts and hepatotoxicity. And we would encourage a relationship with the pediatrician. Again, there's no consensus guidelines here. I know Dr. Fortner yesterday in one of his talks, he did kind of give some um, advice. Uh, and I believe uh, his liver enzymes were checked at baseline and then I think at, at least every three months. So use of modulators during lactation. Uh, we know that there's many maternal benefits from modulator use, including on nutritional status and pulmonary health. All the modulators have been shown in animal models and in humans to be present in breast milk. And so we have to consider possible adverse events related to modulator exposure for the infant while they're consuming breast milk. Again, it would be the risk of cataracts and hepatotoxicity. And we would just encourage the pediatrician to monitor for these adverse events while the baby is receiving breast milk. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these next few slides, but I just wanted to make sure that you're aware of a really wonderful resource by Montemayor and colleagues. It's a resource on medications used in CF in pregnancy and lactation. Um, the lists are not all inclusive, just the most commonly used routine CF medications and antibiotics to treat exacerbations. So this is the slide with the routine medications. Um, <clears throat> I pared down the information. I'm just going to provide the highlights. So as you can see from a quick glance, inhaled therapies are considered safe because they have little to no systemic absorption. Azithromycin was also shown to have little to no risk to the fetus or the infant. And enzymes are fine in both pregnancy and lactation. Most vitamins are fine, with the exception of avoiding high dose vitamin A above 25,000 IUs during pregnancy since it can be potentially teratogenic. As for the modulators, all are considered likely safe in pregnancy and possibly safe in lactation. They've been well tolerated in case studies, but of course there are not any formal studies examining the effects long-term on the fetus or the infants. So we're just starting to um, do studies that are gathering data regarding this. And then this is the actual table from the article, just for your reference. It's pretty easy to read. So what if mom gets sick? Mom needs antibiotics now. Again, Montemayor and her colleagues made another great chart with all the information readily accessible. Inhaled antibiotics are not absorbed, so no harm there. And all antibiotic medications are said to be safe for use during lactation, at least the ones that were listed. There are a few that are not. Um, I'm gonna highlight just the few that should be avoided during pregnancy. So fluoroquinolones should be avoided if possible during pregnancy due to the low risk of fetal cartilage damage. 
Aminoglycosides are usually avoided during pregnancy due to the risk of nerve toxicity, however, can be used if having a severe exacerbation or if critically ill. And lastly, Bactrim is typically avoided since the trimethoprim may impair folic acid metabolism, which is important for fetal growth. And sulfamethoxazole has been associated with fetal hemolytic anemia and neonatal hyperbilirubinemia. I shouldn't have made so many hard words in this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> again, I, I just think it's a great resource, especially for smaller clinics that don't have um, a pharmacist, a pharmacist full-time like our clinic does. We're really blessed to have that. And then again, this is just a copy of the actual table from the article. So now that we've reviewed medication considerations during pregnancy and lactation, I'd like to get to kind of the meat and potatoes of my presentation where I'm gonna talk about something that I'm very passionate about, which is breastfeeding. Um, or I should say lactation, since breastfeeding implies infant feeding from the breast only. But there are several ways infants can receive breast milk, including through direct breastfeeding, bottle feeding of express milk from mom or donor milk, and other modalities. So we all know that there's numerous maternal and infant benefits from breastfeeding and breast milk. But in women with chronic illness such as CF, there are further challenges to consider, such as high treatment burden, we all know that our patients, even on a good day, can be dedicating two to four hours to doing their treatments. And when they're sick, this can quickly escalate to upwards of four to eight hours. Breastfeeding also takes time, whether a mom is directly nursing her infant or pumping and bottle feeding, it all takes time. So this has to be taken into consideration when we're looking at treatment options for our patients. Nutritional considerations, um, on average, it's recommended that lactating mothers consume an extra 500 calories per day. For CF moms, this may need to be a little bit more. And making sure that they're nutritionally optimized is very helpful. So utilizing our dietitians and clinic would be great. Also making sure that they're taking their vitamin supplements and monitoring for any malabsorption symptoms is important. And then of course, adjusting to becoming a parent, this is an adjustment for any new mom, whether they have a chronic illness or not. I know that for those of you who've had children, I'm sure you remember those endless nights and, and um, just imagine having to care for a chronic condition on top of that. So moms with CF have many things to balance, including their own CF care with motherhood and also eventually sometimes go back to work. So just being aware of those um, life changes in our patients. And then lastly, moms with CF are not immune to experiencing postpartum conditions such as postpartum depression, lactation issues, and sometimes decreases in lung function and or increase in exacerbations due to uh, the new juggling act that is their life as a mom now. So how do we provide support to these mothers with CF? <laughs> Provider and staff education and support. So having, participate, uh, having staff participate in a breastfeeding 101 class just to know the basics. If you don't have access to a lactation consultant through your department or organization, consider collaborating with one in um, a local pediatrician's office or with your local breastfeeding coalition. Uh, there should be collaboration between the adult CF staff and the pediatrician and obstetrician offices. And we do like to do closer monitoring for the first few months after delivery. We often see moms within one to three months after delivery, so it's important that we're checking in with them about any postpartum or lactation issues. They may not be seeing any other providers really during that time, and that's a crucial time in establishing breastfeeding. Many of our patients, again, utilize us as their primary care provider, so this, again, gives us opportunity to help. Of course, um, shared decision-making is also encouraged, conversations between providers and patients, considering treatment options and their potential impacts for the mom and their baby. And then also encouraging them to participate in support groups or peer support groups. That has been shown to have a positive effect on breastfeeding duration, as well as self-efficacy and confidence levels in moms who are breastfeeding. And if you don't know the answer, that's okay. Um, there's resources out there. You can refer to a lactation consultant or back to the pediatrician. Many organizations have lactation consultants built within their system. 
but if not, you can refer to outside resources, again, such as your local breastfeeding coalition or La Leche League. And then Peer Connect is also a great CFF resource. We should encourage our patients to reach out to them to see if they can get connected with you know, another mom that's kind of experienced the same that they have or someone that's walked in their shoes. I feel like that type of connection with someone is really crucial. And then encouraging them to participate in focus groups and webinars. There's been some great ones I know on the Seafresh website um, or participating in the research studies like the Mayflower study. So now I'm just gonna go over a few very common problems in lactation, um, just so that you have some tools that you can access or if moms come in to discuss and you know, just that we're aware of them and we know what resources we have. So number one complaint from most moms that breastfeed is they have a low milk supply. They don't have enough milk. So number one, they need to understand that it's a supply and demand system. The more demand, the greater the supply. And just ensuring that they are breastfeeding or pumping on a good schedule. So that's typically every two to three hours and making sure that they have access to a breast pump if they need one and referring them to, again, their pediatrician or obstetrician if they have further needs there. Ensuring that moms have opti optimized their nutrition in the is the, also a great first step. They need to be taking in an extra five to 700 calories per day, as well as have great fluid intake, which is a minimum of eight to 10 ounces of liquid each time they breastfeed or pump, which again is every two to three hours. Um, galactagogues can be used sometimes and they can be helpful. Galactagogues are medications or herbals that can help to increase milk supply. And the most commonly used herbals are fenugreek and moringa. I did do a quick search to see if there was any interaction with trichafta and I couldn't find any, but herbals you know, are not FDA regulated. So there's no evidence-based studies in use with medications. So caution should be exercised there. Other prescription medications that are used uh, to kind of stimulate the breast milk production include Reglan and also Domperidone, which is not available in the United States. It's, I think they use it in Canada still, um, but there are women in the United States that do try to access it uh, so that they can increase their milk supply. And um, you know, we're of course not going to be prescribing these medications for our patients but we should be aware of them since they're widely used and recommended in the lactation community and your patients may be coming to you and asking if it's okay for them to take it. Uh, some foods are also said to be lactogenic and those include things like oatmeal and barley. So oatmeal lactation cookies are popular or you know, sometimes drinking a beer to stimulate your milk production. And then difficult latching. So occasionally babies are tongue tied um, and this can prevent them from latching properly. A hallmark sign of this is a heart-shaped tongue, so when the baby tries to stick their tongue out, they're unable to extend it over the gum line, and there's a little dimple on the end of the uh, tongue resulting in the heart shape. This makes it difficult for them to latch. Moms may complain of nipple pain or a lipstick-shaped nipple when their baby detaches, so those are other signs. For this, I would refer to the pediatrician or lactation consultant. They can help to assess the tongue tie and you know, sometimes they eventually need a phrenotomy to clip it so that they can have more free movement of the tongue. That's typically done in a pediatrician office or sometimes uh, dental providers will also perform that procedure. And then nipple shapes. So nipples come in all shapes and sizes. <laughs> Some are large, some are small, some get shy and hide. So there are devices to help evert the nipple. <laughs> nipple shields to help baby latch on to large or flat nipples while providing mom some relief. Um, however, again, referring to an LC will help to determine the problem and the fix. And then sometimes baby's anatomy makes it difficult to latch, uh, such as having a small mouth, a, rec a recessed chin, or positional problems such as torticollis from birth. And again, a referral to a pediatrician would be recommended. And then lastly, just some common infections that can be experienced during lactation are mastitis and thrush. Recognizing the symptoms quickly will help mothers and babies get needed treatment to decrease the chances of worsening infection or breast abscess formation. So in mastitis, a milk duct gets clogged and infected, 
resulting in a hard mass with redness, warmth, and pain. Mothers will typically develop a fever and report a sudden onset of flu-like symptoms, so it can mimic other illnesses. And mild cases can sometimes be resolved with just increased breastfeeding or pumping and massaging to clear the duct, but generally they need antibiotics. And then if it's not treated in a timely manner, it could lead to a breast abscess, which may need incision and drainage and IV antibiotics. Thrush typically presents as bright red nipples that itch or burn. Baby may have a similar rash in the diaper area and may exhibit oral thrush. It's easily passed between mother and baby, so it's important that they're treated simultaneously. And also recommended um, to boil all pump parts and bottle parts, wash all bras, breast pads, and hot water. Um, the typical treatments are usually topical, so nystatin cream, um, nystatin solution. So those are typically fine with our uh, medications. Occasionally, they do need systemic antifungals, and as we all know, those do interact with trichafta, so there may need to be adjustment there. Um, again, referring to an LC or the baby's pediatrician are great resources for us as providers. And then there are many available resources out there for both mothers and babies and healthcare professionals. So most major cities have local breastfeeding coalitions, which are always great places to start. The La Leche League is a national organization that has a warm hotline uh, where mothers can call with lactation questions and they also offer support groups. Women, Infants and Children's Program or WIC can help to provide um, help with food insecurity and they also have lactation educators or peer counselors that are available. And then American Academy of Pediatrics and Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine are good resources for healthcare providers as far as guidelines. That's where you'll find like the baby friendly information and then the most up to date guidelines as far as what they recommend for breastfeeding. Um, and then a lay person's resource for moms is a website called kellymom.com. It's kept up to date by an IBCLC. It's a fairly good resource. Um, I haven't really found any information on it that's you know, completely inaccurate, but again, it's, you know, it's a lay, written to a lay person. Um, and then some medication resources for healthcare providers include Mother to Baby, which is a service of the nonprofit organization of teratology information specialists. There's also Hale's medication by Thomas Hale. He's kind of like a lactation and medication guru in the lactation world. He has an app that's really easily accessible, so I typically use that. And then there's also UpToDate and LactMed, which are a few other good resources. And of course, there's organizational or maybe organizational support available. So I would look at what's available in your own hospital systems. And then you can also go online to the verification database to look for an internationally board certified lactation consultant as well. And then lastly, just again, being aware of the research that's going on, such as Mayflowers, and then the Seafresh website also has some information and again, Peer Connect. And then I just wanted to close with some real life experiences and comments from mothers with CF in our clinic. I obtained permission from all of them to share their comments and pictures. And I felt like this would really drive home our why of what we do on a daily basis. And we've had 20 pregnancies in our clinic since 2020, I believe, with 11 in just the past year alone. So I'm inspired and in awe of each one of them. Each has their own unique special journey through pregnancy and lactation. And um, they shared some really great advice. And um, you know, just some of the themes that they were mentioning is just that there is a lack of you know, trusted resources out there. Um, some of them mentioned they wish there was more resources about breastfeeding and medication use, and then also what to do if you're not able to breastfeed. Uh, we did have a mom who wasn't able to breastfeed in our clinic, and that was um, really upsetting for her. So she, she was really looking for support in talking with someone that wasn't able to breastfeed and kind of how they dealt with it. Um, they also recommended exercising throughout their pregnancy. They said that that really helps them to feel good and just to get into the best health and shape before they got pregnant. They felt that that really kind of helped them through their pregnancies as well. And these are just a few pictures of some of our moms. Again, I'm so honored to care for them. 
we become so connected to our patients through our work and it's so rewarding to see them become moms and start families. And we just have to remember just to meet each of them where they are, thinking outside of the box and helping them to achieve their goals with lactation, as a parent, as a patient. These are all areas that we have the chance to make a difference. Uh, for example, I recently had a patient uh, who said that her baby's liver enzymes were actually elevated. It's, I think she's about four months old. And she really wanted to breastfeed for exclusively for at least six months. And so she was told by her pediatrician she either had to stop the trikafta for the next two months or um, stop breastfeeding. And it was really important for her to continue to breastfeed, so she opted to stop trikafta. And she said, yeah, I'll just go back, you know, and do combo formula feeding and solids. And I just, you know, started thinking about it. And I was like, well, what about just pumping one to two times extra a day while you're off trikafta and building up a trikafta free stash of milk? And she was like, oh my gosh, I didn't even think about that. You know, so now she'll get to provide more milk for her baby and it will be trikafta free and she'll meet her goal. So just kind of taking those things into consideration um, that will help them to achieve their goals. And then these are my references. And I just wanna give again, a special thanks to our patients who are willing to share their experiences. You all amaze me every day. Also, thank you to the sharing group. Um, that's the Sexual Health and Reproduction, Reproduction Gender Management Group through the CFF. They're doing a lot of great work um, regarding women's and men's sexual health. Also, a lot of work on pregnancy and lactation in CF. And then thank you to my amazing family and also to my wonderful coworkers from UC San Diego. Woo um, and thank you for supporting me through this experience. And thank you for listening. I welcome your questions and feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. That was a great presentation. Any questions? There, I, I know she did. There did come a question oh, through the app, and is um, there any data on the frequency of CF moms having babies with CF? I'm sh I'm sure there might be data, but I did not look at that, so I couldn't answer that. I don't know if anyone else can, but I'm not sure. I would have to look that up. Do you have any experience with that? Do I have any experience with a mom with mm -hmm. CF having a baby with CF? Um, I personally haven't. I mean, I've been in the field for about the last five years. I know that um, we've had some patients that have their babies have had to undergo further testing, but none that have been diagnosed as far as I know. I know we actually um, did have a mom who uh, had a baby with CF and um, it was quite interesting you know someone who wasn't always that compliant she was very compliant with her daughter's treatment but she wasn't always compliant with her own mm -hmm. and trying to convince her of the importance yeah. that's what moms do <laughs> we also have one of those but she's matured a lot <laughs> actually a great segue to my question thank you for this talk this is really wonderful I think good I'm glad. Uh, being in CF for so long before we could get them through pregnancy but breastfeeding was really hard before modulator so now I think is a new landscape mm -hmm. my question to kind of build on that is what is your anticipatory guidance postpartum for moms I think a lot of the focus has always been let me get through the pregnancy all of the issues with that but really the main issues historically and now are when you come home with a little baby and you got all these things to do and you still have treatments how do you help Parent or parents really plan for that period and, and help them through. Is there any guidance that you provide? Right, and I think this, this is, you know, it's so timely because we are seeing such an increase in pregnancies and babies being born. We really need to start thinking about these, these sorts of things. Um, I mean, my best advice is just to kind of be flexible and, um, you know, really talk with your patients and kind of see what they have going on at home as far, especially when you're developing like their treatment regimens, you know, maybe something might need to change after they have a baby because it's just not something that fits with their life anymore. So we need to kind of meet, again, our patients where they're at and just develop something that's feasible for them that will help keep them sane and, you know, 
eventually allow them to get a couple more hours of sleep than <laughs> um, what you can with a newborn. So, yeah. And yeah, definitely encouraging them to ask for help, um, you know, leaning on their family, their, their partners. Um, that's where they can really come into play and help them kind of get that balance down of their CF care and being a mom. Okay, I have a question here on the Q&A um, from Patricia Banks. At what point do you sweat an infant born to a mom on Trikafta, and do you re-sweat when the baby is no longer nursing? So I know I was discussing this actually with my pharmacist yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know the exact point, but we were discussing it and we were saying there would have to probably be a period where mom would have to be off of Trikafta for a period of time for the sweat to be accurate, um, especially after listening to like Dr. Fortner's talk yesterday. He was discussing, you know, several infants that were exposed to ETI in, in the womb and he was talking about, um, you know, clinical implications. One of them was even uh, kind of like a withdrawal almost and caused a rise in pancreatic enzymes, which I never even heard of until yesterday. So um, I don't know the exact time period, but those are definitely things that we need to consider. Do we have any other questions, either the app or coming up to the microphone? Thank you, okay. Christine. All right, thank you. Okay, next up, I'd like to welcome Stacy Mount. Um, Stacy is the CF program coordinator for Rady Children's Hospital San Diego, where she has worked for the last six years. Um, Stacy has cared for people with CF and their families since starting her nursing career as a bedside nurse at Children's National Medical Center. And she is presenting today on clinic attendance and adherence. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, all right, so I'm going to be talking about something that's not really new to our um, community, right? Talking about clinic attendance and adherence, but maybe a little bit worse since 2019 and uh, Trikafta coming out. I have no disclosures. Um, in this talk, I'm going to talk about a little bit about my patient population, just to give you a little perspective, describe the methods that we've used to try to improve clinic attendance, um, and present some data on um, my patient population in reported adherence to airway clearance um, and strategies to improve their adherence. All right, so clinic attendance. Um, just for some background, um, our CF center is located in Southern California. We have about 115 patients um, and only one clinic location. It is in central San Diego. Um, and we do have patients that come from many counties around the area. So from San Diego County, Imperial County, Riverside, and San Bernardino. So some of our patients are coming from far, um, albeit there are other centers um, some people just like to drive to San Diego, I guess. <laughs> um, our clinic sessions, we have about two to three clinic sessions a week, um, uh, one to two morning sessions and one afternoon session a week. Um, and uh, we do have like a lot of our patients prefer the afternoon session um, due to missing school and stuff like that. Um, so that does affect how patients attend clinics and availability. We also do have some combo clinics with our gastroenterologists and endocrinologists. Um, so we use EPIC as our electronic medical record. Uh, within EPIC, we have a dashboard um, that has been built that helps me track all of our patients and what's going on with them. One of the metrics we can look at is follow-up adherence. And you can see here the blue line is kind of our managed patients over time, and this is the number of patients that have been seen within the last 12 months at least once. And then the pink line below is the follow-up adherence. This measurement on this graph specifically is patients that have been seen uh, three or more times in a rolling 12-month period. Um, and that's helping to reflect um, the annual uh, quarterly visits 
Um, so it might be a little bit shy of that for some patients, but um, we'll also allow for those patients that get seen like December and then aren't seen, you know, until three months into the year. Um, so as you can see, um, like in August here, um, our patient population was 117 patients and our follow-up adherence was about 95.7%. And overall, our adherence from this time period from March is about 95%. I should also state, um, as I was sitting here thinking, um, I didn't put in my talk, that we do pretty much only in-person visits. Um, as patients request telemed, we do make allowances for it, um, but most of our patients don't request it, um, and they, again, like to come to San Diego. So um, in the fiscal year of 2021-2022, our physicians were provided some funding to um, do a QI project, and they aimed that towards our appointment attendance to try to improve it. Um, so we did; they did a QI project. In this, uh, we were able to enlist the um, IT support of Epic to create a report um, to assist in our scheduling process. In this project, we also reevaluated the roles of the team members within our clinic um, in scheduling uh, visits. So prior to this project, uh, the role of um, the person who was responsible for scheduling our appointments was me. Um, I always do it at the end of the visit to make sure that they're scheduled for their follow-up. And then I spend some of my um, office hours uh, reaching out to families who have not scheduled their follow-up or cancel or just need to be scheduled. So it's a significant amount of time, even with our, you know, uh, current population. So this is the report um, in Epic, um, and you can see um, the um, uh, blacked out patient information. I'm gonna try to use a laser pointer. Oh, it looks as fancy. Does that? Oh, look at that. It works. Um, so blacked out patient information, and you can actually click into the chart from here. So it's pretty user friendly. Then you have their last routine visit um, in RCF clinic. Then here you'll see the uh, number of visits um, that they've had in the last rolling nine months. Um, and we chose nine months um, to help us get towards that goal of four visits per year. And then obviously here, the next visit, everybody is empty because these are the ones that we need to look at. And then this last one over here is scheduling status. So our scheduling status is a metric that assigned a number and priority to the patient based on how many visits that they've had in the last nine months. So one in red is our top priority. Um, they were assigned this number if they had zero, one or two visits in the last rolling nine months, meaning that they're less likely to meet that adherence goal of four visits per year. Um, and then two in yellow is they've had three or more visits. So they're likely to meet the goal. They just do not have that follow up scheduled and that does need to be addressed. So, like I said, we did review the process, and um, what we did is we enlisted the assistance of our pulmonary admins um, to make these phone calls to get them scheduled, um, and much to my manager's approval, getting it off of my plate as the RN. Um, so, uh, what we did is continue to uh, coordinate appointments at the end of each visit, um, and then uh, what the RN would do is uh, denote in the patient chart in this snapshot area um, if the patient was not returning to our center because they would still populate on the report if they didn't have a visit. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with EPIC, the snapshot is a manual, manual entry field in the chart, but it's not part of the medical record. So it's a really useful tool in tracking things and putting notes for your patients and your team. Um, so we would note, hey, they're transitioning to UCSD for adult, um, and their last visit with us was this date. They don't need another appointment. So then our admin staff will go to the report um, on the previous page, look at the priority number ones, look into their chart to see if they were supposed to be scheduled for a follow-up with us, and then reach out to the families um, to schedule. <laughs> Um, so, you know, like any project and like any EPIC report, there are pros and cons. So pros to this report specifically, it was easy to see our patients that were a priority to reach out to and to schedule. Um, you could easily navigate to the chart from that report as well. Um, so you could get information. So I use this report actually on a routine basis. 
Um, uh, and the process that we developed with this project took the burden off of the registered nurse, the, the clinic nurse, to focus on other more important things like QA projects and NACFC presentations. Um, cons to this is just like any EPIC report, it's not always 100% accurate. Um, so this sometimes would not pull in the follow-up visit even if it was scheduled but at least it didn't miss anybody who wasn't scheduled. So you would have to go into the chart and see, oh, they actually are scheduled, but it wouldn't really miss anybody that didn't have an appointment. So a con, but you know, not the worst thing ever. Obviously with any healthcare field, staffing has been an issue. We've had a lot of turnover personally in our clinic over the last several years in both our nursing and admin staff. So this project unfortunately has kind of gone by the wayside in the process. Um, but I'm hoping to pull it back in now that, well, almost fully backstabbed, <laughs> almost getting there. Um, so that's another con. And then with the snapshot, any, anything that requires manual updates or manual entry is going to be a bit of a burden and, uh, you know, uh, lead to human error, right? So if I don't put in the snapshot that this patient is moving or transferring to adult, and then the admins don't see that, they'll call the family and the family will be like, we're not coming back. So obviously just, you know, not the worst thing to happen, but anything that requires manual updates or manual entry, um, you know, can lead to human error. Um, so other things that we do, um, like I said, I make sure that I'm the last person to see our patients before they leave their visit as much as possible um, while discharging and providing the after visit summary and then I'll coordinate their uh, follow-up appointment with them. It's also best to do that, you know, so that they have the appointment time that they prefer. I also do recommend that if they know in advance where they're gonna be in six months, that they at least schedule two visits um, if they're, you know, doing routine. The other thing is I work with our central scheduling and to look at their protocol when the families call in to them and they will notify me, or they're supposed to notify me, when a patient cancels an appointment and then reschedules outside of intervals. So if they schedule the week of an appointment, they're supposed to notify me and not reschedule them for the next available because it's likely not in that three month interval because they're supposed to be seen this week, right? And then once that occurs, I'll reach out to the team and we'll find a way to see the patient um, so that they stay in the interval. Um, we also, uh, this is more to coordinate and, and provide um, some help in getting lab draws done, but we are lucky enough to be located um, in the same building as our outpatient lab, our lab drawing room, so we can coordinate appointments uh, for the CF clinic and the lab, so especially for our patients doing oral glucose tolerance tests, they're able to go back and forth um, down to the lab and back up to the appointment um, it, to get that done. So it kind of makes it, um, easier to get both the visits and the labs done. And I do have some patients that'll be like, oh, we should cancel because we haven't had our labs done. And I'm like, never do that. Just come, we'll figure it out. And you can go down to lab. I've also worked with lab a lot. And if they go, um, if they don't have an appointment at lab and they'll go um, check in at lab, when they go back down after their appointment, if it's not like an oral glucose tolerance test, they won't lose their place in line. And so that's a really nice feature that our lab has done for us so that they can go down after their appointment, get their quick lab draw and be on their way. All right, so adherence to therapies is a little bit more difficult. Um, so it's always been a major topic of concern in our community as well as the, you know, any um, chronic illness community. Um, and with the introduction of the highly effective modular therapy, in particular Trikafta, many of our patients are feeling better, having fewer symptoms, and enjoying a feeling of freedom from their CF, which is wonderful, we love it, but it's also leading to a decreased adherence to recommended airway clearance therapies, which, as we all know, we don't really have you know, a whole lot of data on, you know, the Simplify study is coming out, and then we don't have a whole lot of data on what that's gonna do to them long-term. So I decided to look at our um, patient population um, more in response to like our sign outs and talking about how our patients are like, yeah, I do nothing. I do something once a week. I might do it when I'm sick. They're getting really honest with us, which is great. Um, but I did a data review of our patients and their reported non-adherence to respiratory therapies. Um, so I reviewed notes of our patients and in particular in our physician notes, they'll state that the parent, parent or patient 
um, says that they're not doing anything. Um, so I did it for not, not doing treatments at all or reporting doing it less than 50% of the recommended time while well. Um, I also looked at if these patients are on um, highly effective modulator therapy, how many number of how many visits they had um, in 2023. I did this data review in May, so it was just the first half of the year pretty much. And then I looked at their age. So when I did this data review, um, the age that reported non-adherence, the age range was 11 to 17. I don't think anybody's gonna be surprised by that because that's always our most difficult age range with the average age of being 14 years old. Um, and so the total number of patients that I pulled from this was, of non-adherence was 19. Um, in our total population of um, about 115, the number of patients we have in this age range is about 45. So that's about a 42% of our patients in that age range are not age range are non-adherent. Um, and it's about 17% of our total population. And of those patients, 15 of them, of the 19 patients, 15 of them are on highly effective modulator therapy. And just of note, three are not up, three were not eligible, and one stopped due to adverse effects. Um, and just at that time, their visit adherence was about 1.85 visits um, for that, that cohort um, as of May. And so that's about two visits in the first half of the year. So that's pretty much adherent to coming to visits, to coming to um, clinic visits. So overall, kind of what we expected. Um, so what we're doing currently to encourage adherence um, is a lot of education. Our respiratory therapists are doing a QI project on um, a, a education. They do this for our patients age five and older. Um, the younger kids, it kind of goes to the parents. The older kids, it goes to the um, patient themselves. They do a quiz on airway clearance therapies and medications. If they score, oh, my, my slide is wrong. If they score less than 80, oh, no, it's not, sorry. If they score less than 80%, they're referred for re-education at the next visit. If on that re-education, um, at that re-quiz, they score less than 80% again, they're referred for a televisit with the respiratory therapist so they can review um, how they're doing their airway clearance therapies at home, cleaning their nebs and making sure they're doing everything correctly. Um, our physicians will also discuss the short-term and long-term com complications of insufficient airway clearance. Um, and then, for the 11 to 17 year old range, um, we have we talked to parents about setting up incentives like cell phone or video game privileges. Um, so even in this age range where it doesn't seem as feasible, we kind of talk about what is something for that patient in particular that they they want access to or want to have so that they can use it as an incentive to complete airway clearance therapies. Uh, we also review it um, in particular for each patient and family and try to fly, find places where we can decrease time and burden. So instead of doing um, nebulizers for things that have MDI versions or offering, you know, um, OPEP devices in place of the um, high frequency chest wall oscillator. So like your aerobica, like, okay, if you do the aerobica in the morning because you're, you're running late, you need that time. But in the evening, you make sure to use your vest and do a really good treatment with that. Um, so trying to make, um, meet them where they're at and trying to make uh, compromises where you can while still encouraging them to do their airway clearance. Uh, we also help them go through their daily schedule and finding ways to make that that accommodation. Um, just like I said, using the aerobic in the morning, vest at night, um, or choosing, uh, one of the things that we've done has been like, okay, you're not doing anything, so let's add on either Palmazyme or Hypertonic, right? So let's do one of those once a day just to get something in. And again, it's meeting them where they're at and trying to add in something, especially if they're reporting that they're doing absolutely nothing. Um, and then we have a big focus on exercise as a form of airway clearance. Um, and so overall, um, trying to, especially with, you know, patients feeling better, they're getting more involved in sports. So exercise um, is really a big push for us right now. Overall, we're just trying to balance current recommendations prior to the new recommendations coming out. 
um, with meeting the patient and the family where they're at and hoping to garner engagement in some type of airway clearance management. And that is all I have to say. Thank you, Stacy. Questions? We do have a question on the app, um, and it's how did you get this build in Epic? Um, well, so the dashboard build uh, was actually made prior to uh, me coming into clinic, so um, that one was with our Epic team. And unfortunately, I can get you that information, but I don't have it myself. It was there when I came in, so I was pretty lucky to have it. It is a wonderful tool, so if you have Epic, I encourage you to speak to your administration and Epic team to get it built. It helps me see who's in the hospital, um, and I can track who's taking what medications, who's got their labs done, and, and lots of different things. So it's very, very helpful. When you look at the status of the, oh, I forget what it is. It's a picture on my phone now. But uh, the number one, the number two, do you oh, have yes. the ability to like filter that? Because I feel like sometimes the number ones, you already know the issues and have addressed them but can't get them in or something. So like, do, do your admins continue to kind of pester those number yeah, ones? Yeah, they, they do just continue okay. to pester. Um, unfortunately, my admins don't know my patients as well as I do, right? And if there are some that I know where we're at with them and that we're not going to get them in, I'll just communicate that via staff message or communication with my admin team. Um, I am very good at pestering my patients, and I do continue to remind them that the current recommendation is the, the every three-month visit. So, you know, I'll say, okay, reach out this week, but maybe don't reach out again for like another month. And then, okay, well, we're two months, you know, they, they need to be seen in two months. So maybe reach out to them every other week or something like that. So we do have that communication for patients who are more difficult to um, get to come to clinic. So it's more of a conversation, but unfortunately, no, there is not a way to address those social issues in this report. All right, that concludes our time for questions right now. Um, we're going to move along to our last speaker. Oh, you're fine. <clears throat> okay, last but not least, I want to welcome Debbie Benitez. Um, Debbie is the program coordinator for the adult CF program at USC and has been in their role since uh, 2003. She is also actively involved in committees for the CF Foundation and has been the nursing chair for the NACFC board since 2012. Um, today, she is also presenting on clinic adherence um, from an adult perspective to be seen or not to be seen. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. Um, so I will be talking about what we're doing um, a little different uh, in the adult world. So. Let me get to my next slide. I'll use this one. There we go. Oh, no. So I have no disclosures uh, related to this presentation. Um, I'm sharing really quickly a snapshot from our um, SMART report with respect to what it looked like over the years with respect to bringing in people for the four visits or a telehealth visit, four cultures and two PFTs. And as you can see over the years, we have obviously maintained kind of this 50 people coming in and uh, pretty much getting those four visits. We, we never had 100% of that um, ever, but um, we certainly had a higher number of people coming to more than one or even two visits, so that's uh, relatively good. And obviously, like anyone, uh, we really didn't see much of that in 2020 with the pandemic and certainly a slow uptick um, after that. Um, we also did take a look at uh, what our data looked like with regards to just at least one visit. And as you can see here, we did pretty good. Um, we really were driving the message with regards to coming back to, to see us after the pandemic uh, strongly and enforcing the need to be able to touch base with how it, they were doing. Okay, so obviously we know that there are many challenges to bringing anyone into the clinic, right? They're feeling fine. Who really needs to come in when they really aren't feeling anything? 
And um, those of you who might be living on the West Coast, it's very costly to live in Los Angeles. We had gas prices near $7 a gallon. Yes, I just spoke to someone who told me they filled up gas going to the airport in Ohio and paid $2.99 a gallon. We were never going to see that ever again in LA. And I think we're actually at $5.39 before I left. So it's relatively costly and it's obviously more costly to be spending your hours in traffic, leaving your job, dropping off your child, making it back in time for school to pick them up. Um, especially when you have the option of telemed. And many of these people did telemedicine when they were uh, needing care during the pandemic. So the option of that really seems more enticing than really taking the time out of their busy life to come in. Uh, we've also seen many of our uh, patients have changes within their insurance coverage. And that has also created limitations in our ability to do diagnostic tests or even to bring them as frequently as we would like. We've also seen people lose disability um, after Trikafta, feeling better. Um, and so documentation has been critical in our ability to demonstrate potentially the need for extending their disability. So for example, um, not indicating that they're feeling good and they're working out and they're going for long hikes. So we need to be mindful about what it is that we're documenting when we do see them, um, if they do need to be someone who needs to continue on disability. So uh, with regards to program specifics, we did take a look at, you know, well, what's our uptick in telemedicine anyway? And uh, what does that look like? So obviously this data demonstrates we didn't perform any telemedicine before the pandemic and saw an uptick in that in 2020. Um, and we've really tried to, um, what's the word I'd say? Uh, not encourage as many telemedicine post pandemic because we really wanted to reconnect with many of these people. We wanted to see what was happening. We did have many people getting pregnant um, and certainly wanted to touch base with them in person. Um, and obviously there are challenges that we all face as care team members, right? We want to be able to understand what is their response to therapy, especially if they started Trikafta right after or right before the pandemic and some even after the pandemic. So we really wanted to make sure, were they experiencing any side effects? What exactly was happening? And we also learned of symptoms um, following initiation that was related to comorbidities that they were experiencing. And we heard some of those talks um, here during the conference with regards to response to uh, their diabetes. We also were concerned about drug-drug interactions. Uh, in the world of social media and feeling good, it's easiest to uh, listen to your peers about new things that are coming on the market, uh, to look better, to feel better, to have more energy. Uh, and so we were concerned about the potential drug-drug interactions related to the Trikafta. And then there was the lab monitoring, right? There were some people that we never received lab monitoring during the pandemic and were concerned uh, in their delay in pushing in-person visits in 2021. Uh, so really talking to them about how we were going to do that, utilizing a lot of our outside lab facilities, LabCorp, Quest, those types of things, and how we were going to implement getting those results timely so we can monitor to see how they were responding. And there was a lot of shift in team roles. I'm sure you're all seeing that now. A respiratory therapist tells us all the time, I'm just the swabber. Um, and so uh, th there's a lot of things that are changing. People are making decisions on what therapies they want to use. And we heard that even just from the pediatric a team with the RT really putting out a QI project to do airway clearance, but there really isn't a need for it, really. If they're not bringing up secretion, um, if they're on the modulator, they, they really are not bringing up those secretions. Then we have the nurse's role. Our, our nurse in clinics role has also changed and shifted, so that brought a different dynamic in our ability to monitor our patients closely and bringing them back timely. Um, and then there was the need to obviously make sure that we were following the guidelines. We wanted to make sure that we were meeting the mark to be able to maintain our grant. As you all know, we're all concerned about that and we want to put our data in Port CF. So that was really critical for us to keep that in mind. Um, and then we decided, you know, we need to do something about it. What can we do? We need to do this differently. So we really wanted to try to move towards, can we get two of the four 
visits in person. We want to be able to uh, allow them to have the telemedicine option, but also uh, give us the ability to connect. So we did a few things. As you can see in 2021, we decided we're going to use the refill as our ability to uh, lure them, encourage them, motivate them to return. Um, and we did this by making sure that when refills came in, and this was particularly related to their ETI, is did they have a future appointment and do we at least see them after the pandemic, right? Did, did we have eyes on them and what was going on? And then we did a shift in 2022 and said, okay, it can't just be that, we need to do it differently. We wanna make sure they have the future appointment, but at least have seen them in 90 days. And this could be telemedicine or in person. And then we said, you know what, we could do a little bit better because we did start to experience um, people getting pregnant more and also experiencing some DDIs uh, that were unbeknownst to us because we hadn't seen them for quite a while. So in this year, in 2023, we decided to do, okay, you have to have a future appointment. We would have had to connect with you within 90 days um, and hopefully had labs uh, within 90 to 120 days. Uh, this year, we experienced two unusual cases in which people develop some severe liver disease um, and some presenting um, in clinic already jaundiced uh, without any acute abdominal pain. And this person had been following the same ETI protocol, which is, you know, after they've had stability in their LFTs, you could do it once a year. So, right, we were following the recommendations, but that wasn't the case in this particular incidence. And so this gave us a scare enough to warrant our need to be able to get labs at minimum and also the need to be able to educate them why and also to talk to them about it's not just prescriptions that we need to know that you get started on it's anything else that you ingest in pill form in a supplement form because they just don't know if we started them in 2019 that initial message has kind of you know dissolved uh, and has obviously diluted into, well, it's not a prescription, so it's okay. I don't need to tell my team. Um, and we learned the hard way with that particular person. So our pharma t pharmacy technician is extraordinary. She is really driving our refill process and really sends this information timely. She does let us know when their last visit date is. She lets us know about the last visit date. Um, and lab date with some results summary if it's known, if we've already reviewed it with our pharmacist or if one of the other providers has reviewed this already um, and also checks if the patient has a future visit. This also then helps trigger any processes in partnering with our scheduling team and our nursing staff to be able to bring those people back either in a telemedicine visit or an in-person visit. Our pharmacist also plays a critical role along with me being able to take a look if there are any additional needs. We partner with the dietitian, right? If we're gonna send this person to get their CMP and GGT, our diet will reach out to the dietitian. Hey, do you need something? Oh yeah, can you add a vitamin D? Try to get all your labs, you're already sending them. Make that vis visit to the lab very efficient. So that's re been really helpful, especially if they're going early in the morning, which many of my adult workers like to go before work. So this is prime to consider a fasting lipid panel, not necessarily an OGTT unless they're planning to take a half day. So having those conversations on how those labs are going to happen so you can add the right lab is really essential. Okay, so we did pull what our data looked like uh, with comparison to 2021 and 2022. Um, and you can we divided this by quarters uh, because we wanted to see what, what was happening with kind of what we were in, enforcing with regards to the refill. And as you can see here, um, we, had a, we are having about the same uh, number of visits in quarter one. So this is January through March, right? So this is that winter seasonal uh, flu, people were getting sick, people in LA don't like to leave their home. So we had less visits and this was something that we did see even this year, but we did have a little bit more, 10 more patients, but saw a lot more no-shows. A lot of people also canceling the same day, right? Oh, I'm going to change my mind. You know, I don't need to come. I'm not feeling good. I can't make it. 
Um, so then you can see in quarter two, we had a little bit of improvement. Well, we did also offer more telemedicine in exchange for same day cancellations or to having, st if we had staff to be able to call them in advance if that was possible. Uh, and we're fortunate to have a program that has a really robust home spirometry program. So telemedicine is great for us because we are able to still have objective data on what their lung function is. So the main concern really for us has been the no-show and the last-minute cancellations. I'm sure this is not, we're not the only team seeing that. I'm sure many of you are also seeing that. So we did reach out to our partner advisory board made up of adults within our program and ask them, you know, what, what is the challenge? Um, and they did report that they'd really like their routine visits when they're feeling good to just be telemedicine, right? What's the need? I feel fine. Everything is good. And I think that's pretty reasonable. Um, and they actually preferred to be in clinic when they weren't feeling well. And it's interesting because I've heard from other programs that they're actually making their sick visits remote. But we actually prefer to bring them in because guess what? We can get tons of sputum that we couldn't get when they're feeling good. And so this has really enhanced our ability to understand what new identified bacteria they might have or be able to really target our antibiotic selection for therapy. Uh, this also uh, is great for um, getting their spirometry. So now we can then launch them to how often we want them to do home spirometry if we place them on oral antibiotics. So that has really been helpful. Uh, we, they also preferred to getting their labs in clinic. So we only have phlebotomy certified medical assistants in our clinic. So when they come to our clinic, we uh, thrive on the one-stop shop. All spirometry is done in clinic. All labs are drawn in clinic. The only thing we don't do in clinic is imaging. And because imaging is rare and infrequent, it was easiest to be able to have them schedule that. So we're really fortunate to have that and it resonated obviously with our adults. The challenges that remain are those that need to go to lab outside facilities, and this is mostly for our managed care plans because those are directed to particular labs or within their PCP. So that is obviously a rate limiter and the need for our nurses to chase those results. And obviously, right, those people that live far away or who don't have the means to come or don't have regular transportation are limited in their ability to come more regularly. But if you can offer the remote, that's always a great uh, option if that's possible. And then we did have challenges with home spirometry because many of our patients who received the device in 2020 were nearing expiration of their machine. They weren't working anymore. They lost it. Uh, so we were fortunate to be able to have some means to be able to purchase some and give them now to some of our adult patients whose uh, devices are now lost or no longer operating. Um, and then we have lessons learned. What did we learn, right? As you can see, it was a continuous cycle in our ability to improve what it is that we were doing. Um, so we obviously, as we heard in all the messaging, it is about meeting where the patient where they are and coming up with an individualized planned approach to what those visits needed to look like, what was possible for that person, and meeting them there. And then creating a digital order for, to our lab facilities outside of the care center so we could automatically receive those results uh, was a challenge, but we were able to conquer that. Um, and then obviously the other things that I mentioned was being able to draw them on site versus somewhere locally. Um, I mentioned already the DDI challenges that we faced with people purchasing social media supplements. Um, and we also had a tough time with the mail-in sputum. We tried to adapt that process. I know many other centers are doing that now, but what we're doing is giving them a bag with a cup, and when they're able to bring to expectorate sputum is to drop them off on that day. They didn't necessarily have to have a visit, but they could drop it off that day and we could have standing orders. Um, and our lab is 24 hours, seven days a week. So we told them you could even drop it off at the hospital on a Saturday or a Sunday. So that does make things more possible for people who might be working and have family busy lives. So something to consider. And then definitely, if you're really uh, pursuing telemedicine as an option, I strongly recommend home spirometry. Uh, because that really has been uh, very well received by both the patient and also by the care team to be able to still maintain and follow up on the response to therapy because some of our PAs still require what is the FEV1 
uh, in these patients on ETI. And if you're only seeing them in telemed, really you have no data, and there may not be somebody who wants to come to the hospital to get their PFT testing. So food for thought there. And then identify key stakeholders, right, in your team. Who can help with scheduling? Who can help with checking labs? Who runs the refill process on your team? And how do you engage them to be part of how to make this uh, a well worth project to work on and improve that process? And then uh, we did want to see them because we were seeing less of them in the hospital. The hospital was such a great place to connect and talk to them and provide more education. And we realized that we really didn't, we really needed to do a better job in communicating why we needed to see them and what were the diagnostic tests we needed, like the labs. And so I was just talking to my respiratory therapist last night and we were saying how it's important to let them know that we've had experiences with some unfortunate rare cases of liver disease and we want to make sure that they understand that asking them to get labs is important and why. Uh, because we, we, are, we don't know what these uh, medications will do long term. And they are their own N of 1. And it's important for them to know that so that they understand it's important for them to come. I just want to uh, thank my team because it really takes a village to take care and uh, perform these QI processes to improve the care of our patients. So many thanks to my village. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Debbie. I'm very help them come as fast as I can. <laughs> Thank you, Debbie. Very timely discussion. Um, wondering if you, as part of your QI, did any kind of um, transparency, like flyers in the clinic, an email blast, newsletter, like don't get your labs, you don't get your refills, like sort of declared it. <laughs> Well, we did do an email blast, but I will tell the truth, we did not do that regularly. So a lot of it was conversations with the pharmacy technician. So we would have meetings with her and let her know, hey, this is our messaging. Hey, this is the process. We'd pull the two medical assistants that did our scheduling specific for CF and let them know, hey, this is the plan. If they try to cancel, we need to let them know how that would impact our refill process. And so. I see more people getting rescheduled, and the messaging is the same, and the patients do let us know that. Uh, they do get upset about the labs, or when we withhold their refill, they don't like it, especially certain people who have been stable. But we did have a gap without a pharmacist, so our pharmacist now is on board, so they're pretty much reviewing and letting us know, you know what, they've been stable for the last six months, they're fine and we refill their meds, so long as they have a future visit. So it's really figuring out who is this person, right. how have they been responding, and is this person reliable and has a future? Yes, okay, refill away. So it's really tailored to the person. This was just an outline of what we wanted to do, but it's really driven the message home that if I don't come or touch base, I might not get my meds. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I try to say to people, like, do you want me to practice bad medicine? Like yes. Safety. It's, it maybe is. It's just another checkbox, like yes. you know, annual chest X-ray or getting the glucose tolerance test. Trying to explain to them that it's safety. It is. It's their safety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you don't want the patient walking in all jaundiced like we did. It was a very fright. And we're like, yeah, but I had a visit, so I figured, you know, you would just handle it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll handle it. I'll have to admit you. <laughs> so you're welcome. I had Thank one question you. Oh, go ahead. on the app. Do you do OGTT in clinic? Yes, we do. We have them come early. So we have someone coming in at 7.30 every day. They can draw their first uh, lab. We, so we do a point of care test. We then draw the serum after we give them the 75 uh, glucola. And then um, the visit happens. And then we send them straight to the lab with the second label so they're not holding up the room and can get the second um, uh, OGTT draw. It just makes it more efficient. We got to turn the room over. We got lots of people to see. We only have one clinic a week, so we need to be able to be more efficient, which is why we do the first draw to get it going, because now they're, they want to stay. They have to stay. They've already invested. <laughs> so they're going to go to the lab. So that's really helpful. Good question. Any other questions? Hey, Thank that you, concludes. Debbie. Thank you.